1 Samuel chapter 20, let me pray and then we'll uh, dive in. I'll give uh, just a slight recap and then we'll jump right into chapter 20 tonight. Father, it is good to be here in your house tonight. We just, just settle our hearts before you as we just come into your presence, Lord, with thanksgiving. We, we enter your gates with praise. Uh, fruit of our lips giving thanks for who you are and all that you have done and are doing and shall do. We just want to glorify you, Lord. It's good to come into the house of the Lord to just, in the middle of the week, just settle our hearts before you and just to remind ourselves that you're on the throne, that nothing is too difficult for you. Lord, in all the busyness and chaos of our world, it's just good to be able to, to come here into your house and to just remove ourselves at least for an hour or so and just commune with you. And we're so grateful, Lord, that you meet us here. We're two or more gathered. There you are right here in our midst. Be glorified now as we study your word together. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Well, uh, we are picking up here in 1 Samuel chapter 20, and we are uh, heading into more and more the life of David, who has been anointed king somewhere around the age of 10 or so, but he will not become king until he's 30. And David's life, we've talked about this, uh, his life is really divided into four phases. The shepherding years were those younger years, the hiding years from Saul, the fighting years, and then the reigning years. And so what we're heading into here into chapter 20 uh, is number two. These are going to be the hiding years for David. He will be on the run from King Saul for some 10 to 15 years. Can you imagine that running really uh, for your life? Um, because Saul is a very jealous man, he is an envious man, he's an insecure man, he's a paranoid man, he's a demonized man really in many ways because the Lord has allowed a distressing spirit to come after Saul because Saul has consistently disobeyed God. And so God has withdrawn his hand of grace over Saul. Even though Saul is allowed to continue reigning as king, God has already determined that David will be his replacement and so as David rises in popularity and Saul falls in popularity among the nation of Israel, Saul becomes more and more distressed, more and more insecure, more and more jealous of David. And so he will try on many occasions throughout chapter 18 and 19 to literally kill David. It isn't a figure of speech. I mean, he throws his spear, his javelin at David, uh, not once, but three times in an attempt to kill him, and David escapes, but nevertheless, Saul will continue to pursue David for some 10 to 15 years. And so by the time we get here to chapter 20, David is now a man on the run. And it isn't because, again, he's done anything. Uh, all he's done is been faithful to the Lord as a young man. He has uh, become, as I said, popular in the eyes of the Israelites because he was the only one who was brave enough to go and fight Goliath and with the Lord's help kill Goliath. And so, you know, you have instant national fame when you are the only one and not even a fighting age in the Israeli army to kill their enemy, Goliath, who represented the whole Philistine uh, people, the whole Philistine army. And so, you know, David is a young man here. He's around 20 years of age by the time we get to chapter 20. Uh, again, he's not even old enough to join the Israeli army. But he is extremely popular among the people, and as Saul's popularity wanes, uh, Saul becomes that much more enraged and jealous toward David. Now, one of the things that David has going for him, besides, of course, what is obvious, the Lord is for him, because David is a young man after God's heart. Um, David also has Saul's son, Jonathan, going for him, because they have a strong friendship. It is a completely platonic friendship. Uh, but they have a strong friendship which will help as a buffer between uh, angry King Saul and uh, young David. There is Jonathan, Saul's son, to kind of run interference and uh, to help uh, de-escalate things. Um, and so Jonathan is going to be an instrumental uh, person in this relationship between Saul and David as this transition slowly begins to happen. Again, you know, God has already anointed by uh, the prophet Samuel, has anointed David to be the next king of Israel, but it won't materialize from the time that David was anointed until he actually becomes king, some 15 to 20 years. And so 
Um, there's a lot that God is going to teach David in the waiting. You know, when, when you think about why would, why would God have David to be anointed at such a young age, but he doesn't actually become king until he's 30. And you have to consider the fact that there, is, um, there are lessons to learn in the waiting. How many of you understand that? You know, there are some things that in your life, as you are waiting on the Lord and waiting on the Lord, and you're wondering, why doesn't this happen? Why doesn't that happen? And I've been praying about this. I've been praying about that. There are lessons to learn in the waiting. And God is going to continue to work on David and shape him to make him more and more into the man that will eventually lead a nation. But there is much preparation work that has to be done in young David's heart before he is at a place where he is ready to lead a nation. And so this is where we left off right here. It's David is on the run. The end of chapter 19, there was this peculiar thing that happens where Saul, as he uh, gets wind that David has gone down to seek counsel from the prophet Samuel. Samuel's still around, but he doesn't have a major role at this point. Uh, David has gone down to uh, Ramah to seek counsel. That's where Samuel was living. When Samuel finds out that uh, David's life is in jeopardy, they scoot on over to another town called uh, Naoth. Saul gets word of this. He sends three different messengers to find David, specifically to kill him. He sends them on a mission to kill David. But every time these messengers get near Samuel, and, and uh, Samuel's uh, young students who are also learning to be prophets, um, these messengers get filled with the Spirit and they start prophesying. And Saul's like, I've had enough of this. And he goes down himself. And the same thing happens to him. The Spirit of God comes upon Saul and he begins to prophesy. Now, he wasn't seeking the Lord. This is just the Lord's way of helping David escape by putting Saul on his face to recognize that there's only really one king, Saul, and you're not it. And so Saul, filled with the Spirit, he takes off his royal robes. The Bible says at the end of chapter 19 that he was naked, but it really doesn't necessarily mean buck naked. It means that he probably had on linen, a linen undergarment. But nevertheless, he falls on his face before God, and he is just, you know, broken for the moment. He's a man who was very unspiritual until he needed to be spiritual. And, uh, and so this is, this is that scene. And while Saul is on his face before God, overcome by the Spirit, David then escapes. Chapter 20, verse 1. Then David fled Naoth in Ramah and went and said to Jonathan, What have I done? What is my iniquity and what is my sin before your father that he seeks my life? And so Jonathan said to him, By no means you shall not die. Indeed, my father will do nothing, either great or small, without first telling me, and why should my father hide this thing from me? It is not so. Now, Jonathan's in a little bit of denial here because Jonathan doesn't want to believe that his father would actually try to kill David, especially after the fact that back in chapter 19, verse 6, Jonathan confronted his dad about this. And said, listen, David is not deserving of death. He's a hero in Israel and you're just jealous. And he, and he really confronts his father and his father promises back in chapter 19, verse 6, okay, all right, I won't kill David. And so Jonathan assumes that his father meant what he said because, you know, our, wor our word should be our bond, but not in Saul's case. And so Saul actually was out to kill David, but Jonathan can't believe it. So he's just like, no, 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 no. And, and besides, if he were going to try to kill you, I'd know about it. I'm his son. Well, the next verse, verse, verse 3, and then David took an oath again and said, your father certainly knows that I have found favor in your eyes. And he has said, do not let Jonathan know this, lest he be grieved. But truly, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, there is but a step between me and death. And so David basically says to Jonathan, of course your dad's not going to tell you because he knows that we're best of friends. And, uh, and if he tries to harm me, it'll grieve you. So he's not going to tell you because he knows that it would hurt you, that you'd be mad about this. And David says, there, but I can tell you, there's just but a step between me and death. Now, is he being dramatic there? No, not really. I mean, the fact is that for all of us, we should live our lives in this kind of an awareness, a constant awareness that we're just but one step away. I mean, who knows? We're not guaranteed tomorrow, friends. Like, we have to have this constant awareness. And I'm not talking in, uh, in a morbid way. I just mean with an awareness that there's no guarantee for tomorrow. We, we got to make sure we're right with God today. 
because we're not guaranteed tomorrow. And we should never take for granted that we will have tomorrow. There are plenty of people who thought they had tomorrow and then, then they didn't. And David especially is at a place where, look, there's somebody hunting him down like, like, like a wild animal. And so he's much more aware of the fact that his life is kind of hanging in the balance. But we should all really be living in a healthy kind of a way with that realization that none of us are guaranteed tomorrow. You know, do you, do you say you, that you love your spouse and your kids um, as often as you possibly can because sometimes does it ever cross your mind like I, maybe I won't see you tomorrow, who knows? No, nobody knows these things. And so um, we should always live under that constant awareness that every day is a gift and we should uh, love our family and our friends as, and, um, and not take a day for granted. Well, in David's case, he has even more reason to be concerned. And verse four says, so Jonathan said to David, whatever you yourself desire, I will do it for you. And David said to Jonathan, indeed, tomorrow is the new moon and I should not fail to sit with the king to eat. But let me go that I may hide in the field until the third day at evening. If your father misses me at all, then say, David earnestly asked permission of me that he might run over to Bethlehem, his city, for there is a yearly sacrifice there for all the family. And if he says thus, it is well, your servant will be safe. But if he is angry, be sure that evil is determined by him. Therefore, you shall deal kindly with your servant, for you have brought your servant into a covenant of the Lord with you. Nevertheless, if there is iniquity in me, then kill me yourself, or why should you bring me to your father? Okay, so David comes up with this plan. He hatches with Jonathan, and he says, okay, here, here's the thing. Here's how we can test whether or not your dad really wants to kill me. Um, and he says, Tomorrow is the new moon. Now, the new moon in um, Hebrew was, is just simply referred to as Rosh Kadesh. Rosh Kadesh just meant it's the beginning of a new month. There, there would be a new moon, uh, the beginning of each month, and that was a time in the Bible where prophets saw the Lord in particular. It was treated much like a Sabbath in terms of it being a, a day of consecration. And so David says, you know, tomorrow's the new moon. It's a special day on the calendar, the first of the month. Um, I've been recruited into your father's court, which, which is true. And he says, um, and so he's expecting me to be at dinner. And, um, and, and I tell you what, I'm not going to come to dinner. And I'm going to stay away for three days. And if your dad is curious and asks, where is he? And, and I want you to make up, this is what he says to Jonathan. You, come on, you're my best bro, right? And so I want you to lie for me. That's what he says. He says, I want you to lie for me, make up a story. Tell your dad that you gave me permission to go to Bethlehem, which is where I'm from, he says, and that I have some kind of an annual uh, thing to attend and uh, with my family and just cover for me. And if your dad's okay with that, and he's like, okay, well, no big deal, then I will know that it's gonna be okay and he's not really trying to kill me. If on the other hand, he's angry that I'm not there around the table, then you know. So he, they come up with this scheme, they hatch this plan and, uh, you know, again, look, David is, he's got feet of clay like the rest of us. So, you know, he's coming up with a lying scheme here. And so you know, he's not a perfect man, but, um, but he's trying to, you know, save his skin here. And so Jonathan said in verse nine, but Jonathan said, far be it from you. For if I knew certainly that evil was determined by my father to come upon you, then would I not tell you? Because David made him promise. David's like, you know, you have to promise. I've made a covenant with you. Like, like we're best friends here before God. And so, you know, you have to be sure to tell me. And Jonathan's like, of course I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you my dad's reaction. I'm not going to hide this from you. Well, David said to Jonathan, verse Verse 10, who will tell me or what if your father answers you roughly or some translations say harshly. And Jonathan said to David, come, let us go out, out into the field. And so both of them went out into the field. And then Jonathan said to David, the Lord God of Israel is witness. When I have sounded out my father sometime tomorrow, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, you know, get a feel for, for what he thinks or the third day. And indeed, there is good toward David, and I do not send to you and tell you, well, may the Lord do so and much more to Jonathan. You know, like if I hide this from you, then God's going to get me on this, I promise. He says, but if it pleases my father to do you evil, 
Then I will, I will report it to you and send you away that you may go in safety and the Lord be with you as he has been with my father. That's an interesting statement because, see, Jonathan realizes that his dad is not really walking with the Lord. But at the same time, he realizes that that doesn't necessarily mean God has abandoned his father. You know, there are times that we dishonor the Lord and God is still faithful to us. Um, there are times that we are unloving to the Lord, and He's still loving. We are, we are unfaithful, and He's still faithful. And so Jonathan realizes his dad, his dad has drifted from the Lord. And, uh, and, and Jonathan realizes that God's hand is upon David. And he, in as much as saying, you know, listen, I totally support you taking over the throne, even though Jonathan was in the rightful place to take over his father's throne, Jonathan understands what is happening here. His family's disintegrating, and it's because dad is not walking with the Lord. Do you know how many households will go the way of the Lord or not, depending on how dad is going? When dad walks with the Lord, most often the family walks with the Lord. When dad is not, it, t it sends a terrible example. And it's harder for the rest of the family. And so Jonathan realizes, my dad's not walking with the Lord. He says, but nevertheless, the Lord has been with him. And Jonathan says, and I know the Lord is with you, David. Verse 14, and you shall not only show me the kindness of the Lord while I still live, that I may not die. You shall not, you shall not only show me the kindness of the Lord while I still live, that I may not die, but you shall not cut off your kindness from my house forever. No, not when the Lord has cut off every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth. Now, what he means by that is it was common in those days when there was a change between one royal family to another versus just a descendant within that same royal family taking over the throne. When there was a complete change of royal families, it was typical in those days for the succeeding royal family to kill off anyone from the previous royal family so that there would be no potential for some heir to try to reassert himself to the throne. So that was typical. And Jonathan realizes, you, you might be inclined to kill me when you become king and take over as the royal line. You might be inclined to kill me. And he says, I want you to promise, like, I'm, I'm your best friend. You got to promise you're my best friend. I'm going to find out from dad what he's up to. But you have to promise me no matter what happens in the future, you will show kindness to me and, and you won't kill me. You won't cut me off. And so verse 16, and so Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David saying, let the Lord require it at the hand of David's enemies. And then the next verse says, now Jonathan again caused David to vow because he loved him for he loved him as he loved his own soul. And we, we talked quite a bit about this. I, I, I'm not going to go back over it again, but in, in chapter 18, when, it, when we first are introduced to this friendship that is between Jonathan and David, um, I'll just mention it again, probably for the last time, but this is a, a relationship that the homosexual community has hijacked the narrative on and wants you to believe, and even liberal theologians, that somehow David and Jonathan had some kind of a gay relationship going on here. That's not what is happening. I've already broken down the words with you in previous studies back in chapter 18. But it is a very strong bond between two warriors who have deep love, admiration, and respect for one another. And as we've been going through these chapters, I've been throwing up on the screen for you certain principles, kind of little takeaways from each chapter. And this is going to be the, the takeaway from all of chapter 20. And I'm, I'm throwing this principle up in the middle of this chapter because it only continues in this same, with the same theme. And that is that loyal friendship is a rare and invaluable gift. And I mean that in both ways, that it is a rare and invaluable gift that you can offer another, and it is a rare and invaluable gift that someone can offer you. You will probably count on one hand the number of close friendships that you will have in the course of a lifetime. You will, you know, most of us have many acquaintances, um, and many that we would call friends. But a kind of close friend 
the kind of person that you can be completely open and vulnerable, honest with. They know you, you know them. You have their back, they have your back. You're praying for each other. You're holding each other accountable. You love through thick and thin. Um, those kind of long lasting, deep friendships are rare and they are invaluable. And the Bible tells us so. so Proverbs 17, 17, a friend loves at all times and a brother is born for adversity. Like, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I'm sure that everybody here could probably remember some person in your life that you thought was a friend, but then when hard times came, they bailed, and you found out they weren't really your friend. And, you know, sometimes those difficult things are an opportunity to really prune who really is a legitimate friend and who isn't, because a friend loves at all times, and a brother or a sister, someone who's like family to you as a friend, um, will be there through adversity. And... Um, and those are your true friends. You end up finding out who your true friends are when you're going through the worst of times. It's easy for people to love you when you're lovely. But when they love you when you're unlovely, when you're down and out, when you have nothing, those are some true friends. Proverbs 18, 24, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Of course, that ultimate friend we have is in Christ. He's the one that sticks closer than any human being. But friendships are things that God wants us to experience, and yet they are often very rare, the kind of deep, close friendships that you see happening here between Jonathan and David. And again, as I pointed out, there's tw anywhere from 20 to 30 year age difference between David and Jonathan too. Jonathan was, was really a generation older than David. So it transcends age, it transcends, you know, uh, backgrounds or dynamics or, or whatever might be a part of your life that God can sometimes bring people together. And, um, and it's just, uh, it's, it's a God thing that he, um, when he initiates a genuine, wholesome, healthy friendships. And so that's what you see happening here. And, and uh, it's, it's this whole chapter. Really, so let's carry on reading verse 18. And then Jonathan said to David, tomorrow is the new moon and you will be missed because your seat will be empty. And when you have stayed three days, go down quickly and come to the place where you had on the day of the deed and remain by the stone Ezel. So apparently there's this big stone that was, they named it and they knew where it was. And so that's gonna be the, the meetup location. And he says, when I will show, when I will shoot th three arrows to the side as though I shot at a target and there I will send a lad saying, go find the arrows. If I expressly say to the lad, look, the arrows are on this side of you, get them and come. Then as the Lord lives, there is safety for you and no harm. But if I say thus to the young man, look, the arrows are beyond you, Go your way, for the Lord has sent you away. And as for the matter which you and I have spoken of, indeed, the Lord be between you and me forever. All right, that sounds a little confusing. Let me break it down. Basically, I, they come up with this kind of Morse code. And Jonathan says, okay, here's the plan. Uh, just like you said, David, uh, I'm going to go home. And at the palace, uh, we're going to have dinner. It's going to be the new moon. Three days, you're not going to be there. We'll see how my dad reacts to your not being there. This is what I want you to do. I want you to go hide by the stone of Azel. You know where that big stone is that we always hang out around? Okay, go, go hide out there. Hide behind this big rock, okay? Some kind of a boulder-like thing. And he said, and I'm going to send you a signal. And um, you're going to know because I'll treat the stone like it's a target. And if I shoot arrows, three arrows, just off to the side, it means one thing. It means um, it's okay and it's all good and the coast is clear and you can come out and come back. If I shoot the arrows and I lob them a far distance away and I say to the lad who's collecting the arrows, just keep running. It's way, way beyond. You'll, you'll get my arrows. Go retrieve my arrows. But, but if I shoot them way far away, then that's a signal to you that you need to go way far away. Okay, that's what he's saying. So it's either going to be off to the side, coast is clear, or the arrows are going to be lobbed far away, and that's your signal, like run for your life. Okay? So they've worked this out together. And it says, and then verse 24, then David hid in the field, and when the new moon had come, the king sat down to eat the feast. Now the king sat on his seat, as at other times, on a seat by the wall. And Jonathan arose, and Abner sat by Saul's side, but David's place was empty. 
Nevertheless, Saul did not say anything that day, for he thought, well, something has happened to him. He is unclean. Surely he is unclean. And it happened the next day, the second day of the month, that David's place was empty. And Saul said to Jonathan, his son, why has the son of Jesse not come to eat either yesterday or today? And so Jonathan answered Saul, David earnestly asked permission of me to go to Bethlehem. Okay, so here's this little, this lie, right? And he said, please let me go, for our family has a sacrifice in the city, and my brother has commanded me to be there. And now, if I have found favor in your eyes, please let me get away and see my brothers. Therefore, he has not come to the king's table. So that's what Jonathan says. He's in Bethlehem. And then Saul's anger, look at this, verse 30. Then Saul's anger was aroused against Jonathan, and he said to him, you son of a perverse, rebellious woman. All right? We have another phrase for that, son of a bee, right? That's what he calls his own son. He's calling his own son that, which is, you know, that's not a very good comment against about your wife either, right? You son of a perverse, rebellious woman, do I not know that you have chosen the son of Jesse to your own shame and to the shame of your mother's nakedness for as long as the son of Jesse lives on the earth? You shall not be established, nor your kingdom. Now, therefore, send and bring him to me, for he shall surely die. All right, so Jonathan now knows. Dad's having a bad day. He's like, uh, not had his cup of coffee, and he's a little ticked off. And uh, he's just called me an illegitimate son, and, um, and he wants to kill my best friend. This is not a good day. It's not going down like I thought. And Jonathan answered Saul, his father, and said to him, Why should he be killed? What has he done? And then Saul cast a spear at him to kill him, his son, by which Jonathan knew. He's Captain Obvious. He knew that it was determined by his father to kill David. I think I understand now. You actually do want to kill my best friend because you also want to kill me. And so Jonathan arose from the table in fierce anger and ate no food the second day of the month, for he was grieved for David because his father had treated him shamefully. And so it was in the morning that Jonathan went out into the field at the time appointed with David, and a little lad was with him. And then he said to his lad, now run, find the arrows which I shoot. As the lad ran, he shot an arrow beyond him. So he's lobbing it far away now. When the lad had come to the place where the arrow was, which Jonathan had shot, Jonathan cried out after the lad and said, Is not the arrow beyond you? And Jonathan cried out after the lad, Make haste, hurry, do not delay. And so Jonathan's lad gathered up the arrows and came back to his master. But the lad did not know anything. Only Jonathan and David knew of the matter. And then Jonathan gave his weapons to his lad and said to him, Go, carry them to the city. Like, go, go away, because now he's going to have this last conversation here with David. And so it says, as soon as the lad had gone, David arose from a place toward the south, fell on his face to the ground and bowed down three times and they kissed one another. Okay, again, this is com completely platonic, especially in that culture. When I go, I'll be in Israel next week. When I, when I go to Israel and, and some of the men that I've known there for years, it's, I mean, that's just the way it is in that culture, okay? Uh, and even in the New Testament, four times, Romans 16, 16, 1 Corinthians 16, 20, 2 Corinthians 13, 12, 1 Thessalonians 5, 26, talk about greet one another with a holy kiss. So, you know, it's, uh, it's a very culturally acceptable thing that uh, still happens. Um, uh, the, the men and the women are very friendly in this way. So, so there you go. They kissed one another. But listen, and they wept together, but David more so. And then Jonathan said to David, go in peace, since we have both sworn in the name of the Lord, saying, may the Lord be between you and me and between your descendants and my descendants forever. And so we arose and departed, and Jonathan went into the city. So this is a very, um, it's obviously an emotional moment uh, between two best friends who uh, David realizes he probably will not really see David again. Um, and that will, that will be true in some regards because David will just be a man on the run. He'll just have slight interactions here and again uh, with Saul and Jonathan. But, but really in terms of them living life or doing life together, that's gone now. That's gone because David, David's going to be a man on the run. And um, tragically, you know, spoiler alert, but Saul and Jonathan will both die in battle um, in about another 10, 15 years. 
Um, and so the friendship that would have normally been there, like when you know two buddies get to hang out together, they're not hanging out together. Like this is it because dad, dad will, will not stop short of just killing David. And so chapter 21, now David came to Nob. Where is Nob? Uh, it's just past Lincoln and Blinken. <laughs> okay. That's Nod anyway, so it doesn't, it's not even a good joke. But, um, but I want you to notice with me, no less than eight different places, David hides in Ramah, Naoth, in the fields of Gibeah where he was by the stone of, of um, Elzar. He's going to hide in Nob. In the tabernacle, he's going to later hide in Gath, the cave at Ajalam, Mizpah, and the forest, and the forest of Hereth. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different locations in uh, three chapters. He's, so it just shows you like we're in these hiding years. He's going to go from one place to another because as soon as Saul finds out where he is, he just continues to run to another place, to another place, to another place. So, so now he's on the run. Da David came to Nob and he comes here to Ahimelech, the priest. And Ahimelech was afraid when he met David and said to him, why are you alone and no one is with you? <laughs> like, like the guy who chopped off Goliath's head is showing up at the tabernacle where the priest is alone. And so Ahimelech is like, mm, why are you here alone? Like what's going on? This, you, you shouldn't be here alone. Now Ahimelech is the priest and notice that the tabernacle has been relocated from Shiloh where it was for some 400 years to this town Nob. And it stays there just for a short period of time. We're not sure why it was relocated located there, but that's where it presently is. Ahimelech is the priest. His name in Hebrew, Ahimelech, means my brother is king. And he's the priest. And he asked David, why are you here? Why are you alone? And so David said to Ahimelech, the priest, the king has ordered me on some business and said to me, do not let, let anyone know anything about the business on which I send you or what I have commanded you. Okay. So he's lying again. You know, David, David is in survival mode. Um, I'm not condoning it. I'm just saying he's lying because he's trying to protect his skin. So he shows up at the priest's house, at the you know, house of the Lord, the tabernacle. He's like, I'm on a secret mission by the king. I can't talk about it. If I talked about it, I'd have to kill you. All right. But I'm here and I'm here alone. I just can't discuss it. And I have directed my young men to such and such a place. So the reason I don't have uh, my army with me is because they're on a mission, uh, such and such, uh, somewhere else. And now, therefore, verse 3, what have you on hand? Give me five loaves of bread in my hand, or whatever can be found. He's hungry. He shows up at the tabernacle of the Lord. He figures, you know, church people usually have some good food. There's got to be some, some manna there. There's got to be some Krispy Kreme. What you got? You got some bread? You got some bread with a little glaze on it? And so verse 4, and the priest answered David and said, there is no common bread on hand, but there is holy bread if the young men have at least kept themselves from women. Now, he, David's alone, but the priest assumes that David's ragtag army, because, you know, there were some followers that David had, that, that they're going to be meeting up with David pretty soon. And so the priest says, listen, I've got, I've got, I've got the showbread. Now, little, little history here. In the house of the Lord, in the tabernacle of the Lord, there was a table, and on the table were 12 loaves of bread. And it was called uh, panim lechem. Panim lechem means bread of the faces. It's a very interesting translation. Um, in our English Bibles, it's referred to as show bread because you would um, put the, the, the bread, 12 loaves representing the 12 tribes of Israel, in the presence of the Lord in the tabernacle where the bread would be face to face with the presence of the Lord. So it's called the bread of the presence or the showbread, uh, painim lechem, uh, the bread of faces, because it, it faced, it, it, uh, it encountered the presence of the Lord. And um, here, here's the way that it was supposed to work according to the Levitical law. The priests every morning would put these 12 loaves of bread on the table in the presence of the Lord. And at the end of the day, the priests would eat that it was considered consecrated or holy bread. And so Leviticus prescribed it this way. Only the priests are to eat the loaves of bread. And then the next morning they put out fresh baked bread. 
And so when David shows up hungry and he says, you got some bread? And he goes, yeah, I got bread, but I don't have common bread. I only have the bread that is the show bread, the table of the Lord. And that's only to be eaten by the priests. And David says, but, but I'm hungry. And so the priest says, well, have your men at least kept themselves from women. Now he's asking a question of purity. Have they been sexually pure? At least tell me that your men are pure enough so that I can give you this consecrated bread. Because this is a sacred kind of a, of a thing here. And so David responds, he answers the priest, and he said to him in verse 5, Truly, women have been kept from us about three days since I came out, and the vessels of the young men are holy, and the bread is in effect common, even though it was consecrated in the vessel this day. Now, he says there, the men have kept themselves from women. Okay, well, there are no men. So he's, he's, the whole thing is a ruse. He's, he's just lying. Um, and, and he says, so, so we're consecrated, and, and so you can give us the consecrated bread. All, all is well. And so it says, and so the priest gave him holy bread, verse 8, or verse 6, for there was no bread there but the show bread, which had been taken from before the Lord in order to put hot bread in its place on the day when it was taken away. So the priest gives him this bread. Now, interestingly, in the, in the margin of your Bible, you might want to just write Matthew chapter 12, verses 1 to 8, because Jesus refers to this event. In Matthew chapter 12, Jesus with his disciples are strolling through a grain field, and it's a Sabbath day. Now, the law said, the Jewish law said, no work on a Sabbath day. So, Jesus and his disciples are strolling through a, a grain field, and they're plucking the heads off the wheat, and they're r rubbing the, the grain in their hands to separate the kernels from the chaff. And then they're, and they're eating the kernels as they're walking through the grain field. And some religious leaders come unglued. And they say to Jesus, what are you doing? You, you, your disciples are, see, in their minds, they thought, you're walking through a grain field. And in effect, you're harvesting the grain. And it's a Sabbath. You're not supposed to be doing any work. And Jesus refers to this story when he rebukes the religious leaders. He says, have you never read about how David went into the tabernacle of the Lord and took the bread from the priest, even though it was consecrated bread? Like technically, according to the law, David should not have been permitted to eat that bread. But the priest realized that the guy was hungry and doing the right thing is more important than just trying to be right. Okay? And so Jesus says, my own disciples are hungry. They're walking through a grain field. They can pluck the heads of grain and eat it because they're hungry. So you're stumbling over minutia in the law. And here's the principle for us out of chapter 21. Beware of legalism, which is really the desire to be right more than the desire to do the right thing. This was technically against the law what the priest did here for David. But Jesus actually uses it to remind the religious leaders of his own day, there can be this tendency to be legalistic, which is not a good thing. And legalism is often when you just want to be right. But there's a, there's a more necessary thing. And the more necessary thing requires you to do the right thing. So I, I give you an example. So we have a it's an internal policy among our, our pastoral staff that we put in place many years ago that uh, pastors better not be seen alone uh, with a woman in a car at a restaurant unless you're related to her. She's a family member or your wife or, you know, a sister or somebody, a cousin. But you're not going to be like counseling a woman one-on-one -on -one in a restaurant. You're not going to be with another woman in a car. And, um, and so... I get a call from one of our pastors, uh, this has happened a few years ago, and said, hey, um, just want you to know I'm on the side of the road. Um, there's a lady that I stopped. It's pouring down rain. She's having car trouble, single lady by herself. And uh, do you have any problem if I ask her to hop in a car and I'll take her to a gas station or take her to wherever she needs to go? Now, had I been legalistic, I would have said, that's a rule. I'm sorry. Drive on. Leave the lady there in the rain. 
okay? And I appreciated that he called me to just kind of, you know, a little internal accountability. And I said, yeah, thanks for calling, of course. You know, take her where she needs to go. So the, the Pharisees were guilty of, you know, the latter. Like they would have been like, I'm sorry, the rule is no other woman in your car. I don't care if she might get struck by lightning. I don't care if she's stranded there. I don't care that it's midnight. Drive away, right? That's legalism. That's wanting to be right because that's the rule. And sometimes in an effort to want to be right, listen, husbands and wives, this plays out in marriage all the time. In an effort to want to be right, we don't do the right thing. And so we have to guard against legalism. It can creep up in our lives. And the priest gave David the bread and he ate. And we'll end here at verse seven. Now a certain man of the servants of Saul was there that day detained before the Lord, and his name was Doeg, an Edomite, the chief of the herdsmen who belonged to Saul. So we're first introduced here to Doeg, but we are not going to hear the last of him. He's there to observe what happens. He sees how Ahimelech gives David the showbread, and he registers it, and he's going to use it against David later. So he's, he's not a good guy. Doeg. He's one letter off from a dog. That really is what he is. He's a dog, and he's going to act like that. He's not a good guy, but we'll pick it up uh, when I get back from Israel. We'll pick it up there, but let's pray for tonight. Lord, thank you for this time we've had in your word. We just give you the praise and the glory and the honor. Help us, Lord, on this last point, not to just want to be right, but to do the right thing. And Lord, um, there's a little bit of legalism probably in all of us if we're not careful. And so, Lord, we, we pray that you would help us in that regard. And thank you, Lord, for even pointing out this example uh, in Matthew 12, Lord, for us to be reminded of. And thank you for friendships, Lord. They are rare and they are invaluable. And we thank you, Lord, when you bring people into our lives who, um, who we can... Um, do life together with. And we're, we're grateful for, for good friends, Lord, that you bring our way. And may we be good friends. Uh, it's, it's easy for us to just always want, who's my friend? But we should also be wondering, how am I a good friend to someone else? And so thank you for these lessons, Lord, as we make our way through your word. And we give you praise and glory and honor in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen.